All right. Greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here to shine a light, not specifically on the goings on down south, but to, to shine a light into some veg vegetable gardens and the goings on around them. Um, it's not the first time I've tackled this topic, uh, and it's not the first time the guest on screen has uh, been on my channel as well. You'll recognize him from a very a recent episode, actually, this year. Um, it's called um, Tips and Tricks for Starting a Vegetable Garden, and uh, uh, you can see uh, I've invited him back. And, uh, of course, he is Brendan Hill. He is the urban farmer, green thumb, and... Uh, uh, last time there was a high demand to to have him back on and i thought now when spring started i was in a in a in a mood to start planting again um because i knew uh my well firstly i could see my plants knew that the the new season had come i mean they were they were some of them were alive during the winter and i knew they were hibernating or they were just taking it slow because the, the, there's not a lot of sun and it's cold and they don't want to expose their leaves to too much frost um, but then when, when September came along this, they just, something just triggered them and they just started popping off with their, their flowers, uh, their, their leaves. And uh, I could see they knew it was spring now. And then I realized, but that's my signal to start now, uh, taking spring seriously as well. So welcome back on the show, Brendan. I'm looking forward to it, to hear your experience since the last time we've chatted. Well, hi, Aaron. Thank you. And thank you everyone on the channel. Yeah. I'm looking forward to our chat and thank you for having me back. Right. And uh, yeah, so this time the thumbnail of my of my episode is actually a picture from my own garden. Um, the, the spinach, I, last time when we talked, we were talking about planting in winter in the, the southern hemisphere. Um, and some one of a great crop for winter is actually spinach. It's a from in my experience, a year round crop. It does prefer spring and summer when it's nice and warm and a lot of water, but it can also grow to a, a yield level during winter. So it's a nice crop to to rotate in during winter. And that's been my experience. I mean, it's the first time where I've had a vegetable where I've now had a vegetable garden through multiple um seasons and it's uh, there's mm -hmm. a lot that I've learned in the meantime but that's why I wanted to talk to you about as well Brendan is uh, what your experience this winter was if you've learned anything new what succeeded if you tried anything new uh, but we'll get into all of that so let's start off with a a simple thing and we've talked about this mm -hmm. off off screen or off uh, off air but i think it's a good place to start have you started your your spring prep or are you waiting uh, for rain to arrive here in, in gauteng yeah so it's been quite a dry little start to our springtime so and the ground is kind of hard still and a bit dry so i have waited i haven't planted anything or sown anything into the ground uh, I've started a few little things in the tray, but um, very, very small. Um, but at the moment, it's dry. The, the ground is hard. Uh, we need that first rain to soften the ground and get everything uh, ready and prepped for our mm. uh, spring garden start. Yeah. 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 yeah and the, the thing is, well, what we mentioned as well <clears throat> when we were chatting off is the fact that uh, nothing beats rainwater. I mean, the I think just the nitrogen content, the different minerals and the that are in, is in there um just gives it the edge i mean your lawn is the best example where that happens or any lawn for that matter where it, it'll be dry during the winter but when that first spring rain comes that lawn just comes alive and the entire garden just becomes green and, and you could give that lawn a uh, municipal tap water for weeks and it will not have the same effect <laughs> it'll have like a little sad green uh haze to it uh, have you had the same experience with rainwater versus municipal water yeah, so I'm a bit of a, 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 a what a snob. <laughs> We've got a Jojo tank in our garden, uh, a big one. So I've been fortunate to never ever have to use municipal water at all. It's all rainwater, and it's always been rainwater from the beginning. So very fortunate, and uh, my plants are very fortunate because they've got all of uh, all of the water the way God intended it. <laughs> mm, yeah. Mm. No, but, that's nice. And well, I, I also had, I think I've tweeted about it and I talked about it on the previous episode. I do have my water catchment system and it lasted me almost to the end of winter. I mean, I have about, I think, a 500 liter capacity at this moment. And really um, it, uh, it lasted me until just a few weeks before the end of winter. So I, I had to switch to uh, municipal water, seeing as uh, most of my plants have had already started growing by that time. And uh, I couldn't let them just wait. Um, mm. until uh, the, the rain came i thought my bet was that it was going to start raining very early in september and that it, I, I was betting on that gamble that yeah. it pay off but i had to uh, had to do uh, some i had to 
uh, give some <laughs> municipal water there. But yeah, that's uh, that's that's how it works. That's the that's the business of planting and uh, growing your own veggies. But yeah, I, I mean, we, this winter though, you probably had some plants of your own that you uh, that you uh, were growing during winter. I mean, as you've said on the previous episode, mm. plants do grow year round, but they have their seasons that they prefer. Hmm. Yeah, so the, the winter garden was still abundant. It just wasn't a, a big variety. So we didn't have a lot of different plants. It was leafies and roots. And it's unfortunate that it's that boring. But yeah, we, we, we always have carrots in our garden through year round. There's always just a little carrot somewhere. And um, we are never short of stew ingredients with our carrots, mm -hmm. onions, spinach. Uh, we had a lot of lettuce. We couldn't even give away the lettuce. We had so much. Like no one wanted to take it. Um, but it is just that boring. It's some leaves and some roots. Um, yeah, and we did get some rogue strawberries. But the rest of it, uh, unfortunately, all the good stuff that I enjoy is the summer side. Um, so we just have to wait. And hopefully that rain comes soon. Or well, I might be joining you on the municipal water, <laughs> watering my garden with that. Which I don't yeah, because the, the, the frost being gone and the, the sun coming up earlier is just, you can see it's energizing the plants and they're ready to, yeah. to take off. Um, so when it comes to, let's say now, um, you get into your, your planting phase now for spring, what is on the menu? What's like your go-to? I mean, there, there's no mm -hmm. doubt this is where you're going to be reaching to... Uh, to start the spring off yeah so I, I want my chilies to get going again that's my favorite thing to grow it's just because it's interesting you can make a lot of stuff with it and then um the squashes i did mention last time that squashes made me feel the most safe like if there was ever a food i was going to grow that's abundant and there's a lot of it and it makes you feel full it's squashes so i've got a nice little flat piece of ground that's kind of stony and a bit difficult to dig into so I'm going to plant my squashes there, quite a different variety, maybe pumpkin, gem squash, who knows. And in between, um, growing corn like up vertically. So there'll be the ground cover of squash with my small space, just my little backyard with the, the corn coming up. Then the regular mm. tomato, um, what, what else are all the good stuff? Tomato, onions, still spinach, um, still carrots, beetroots, and all the rest of the other good things. But yeah, the main shift that I'm doing this year that is a little bit different to how I've done it previously. I had um, strawberries, which were, were cool and they're lovely and I enjoy eating strawberries. But now I want more um, year round grows of food. So all the fruity things I want to start growing. Blueberries. Um, I have a lemon tree in the ground for three years now. It hasn't fruited yet. Uh, an orange tree and an avar tree and a grapevine. I mm. want to add some more of those things so that uh, the plants are stable, they grow big, and we can always just pick and eat when we can. So that's mm. the next goal for me. Yeah, and something I've learned as well um, is that with fruit specifically, it, there's a certain level of maturity that a tree needs to get to before it starts fruiting. Um, have you done, now that you're saying you want to uh, incorporate more fruits into what you're planting, have you done some research into how long it takes some fruit to start, um, in general, to start fruiting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they are a little bit different even within the same species. Like you can have a, a lemon tree that will fruit in three, four years and some that will fruit in seven years. Um, mm. And also the conditions are, are important. If it's not happy, it will be stressed and it will use that time to vegetate um, just to get itself stronger. So, and some fruits need a particular pollinator, like a fig tree needs a, a wasp and it eats the wasp. The fruit consumes the wasp and that's the pollinator for the fruit. If it doesn't have that wasp, there won't be any fruit. So they are also vastly different. They all have their own needs. Um, and some of them are crazy, like an average tree is like 10, 11, 12 years before you, you see mm. even just a little baby fruit. Um, but then I also had a little orange sapling planted in the ground and that grew two baby little oranges, maybe this size, and that was a year of growing. So mm. I don't know, I don't know if there's hard and fast rules of plants and fruits, but maybe the general trends, you can just short Google it and find what particular tree you want. 
Mm. Yeah. I see there's some uh, general questions here. Sideline opinion asks, uh, Brendan, do you believe in green think fingers? Uh, so I assume, I think that that means if you're, you just have a natural affinity to working in the garden. Is that correct? I believe that you have a green attitude. I don't believe in like uh, uh, just a hidden talent of being good at plants. I think either you care about plants and if you do, you'll pay attention to them and give them what they need. Um, I don't think anyone has a technique that is magic and powerful that no one else can do. Uh, I don't know if you meant it that way, but I think it's an attitude thing. If you care, you, you'll see it. And mm -hmm. uh, if you don't care and you just want a pure function, pure like, da, 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 I don't think uh, it'll be the same thing. Yeah. Um, but if and that's your style, go for it. Yeah. yeah, and I was talking to a mate of mine just uh, over the weekend about specifically that where I think the big frustration with plants is the fact that often the factors that are hindering it, you can't see them. So it's not like uh, you can just see, oh, the, the ground is dry, therefore the big problem is it's not getting enough water. I mean, it's never that simple. It's like there's something wrong in the ground, like the pH or the it's not getting enough shade or it's it's uh, it doesn't have a support structure that it's growing on or... Uh, another plant is competing with its roots it's something we have to look closer to find what's going on it's not something that's readily apparent of like oh if the reds uh, the the leaves turn red that means you have to give it more bone meal um mm. it's it's often something that you you have to go discover you almost have to go investigate and then you kind of have to work on a hunch i mean uh, the best example with my plants was um so I don't have a, a big garden. Uh, I only I can only grow my vegetables in big containers that I bought on special. And um, I realized that uh, my plants weren't doing so well. Many of them were remaining very small. Some of them uh, uh, some of them were dying, like the the chamomile. And then I I just thought my suspicion was the ground is uh, is too moist for too long, and it's creating uh, funguses are growing and fungi are growing mm -hmm. in it. So I just elevated all, uh, and this is all going on speculation, just by look at investigating. So I elevated all the containers on bricks to create more of a more of a flow of the water out of it, so it drains better. And then I think a week or so later, all these plants were just doing so Covered. much better. Yeah. And it's Great. it's that nice feeling of uh, conquering, uh, finding a solution. Five, well, firstly, identifying the problem, and then also find, building a solution and doing a solution. But that's that's the fun thing about doing this is you you mm. it's trial and error it's not something you're going to nail the first time i think that's a big misconception yeah absolutely it is a learning iterative process where it's a little bit little bit little bit over time that adds up um, but i do think you'll run into more trouble in containers than you would into the ground mm. i think the natural ecosystem takes care of so many more things than we can be aware of and that's right. just uh, nature knows best and i'm very hippie like in that way i'm super hands off super no chemicals super like let the plants do the work and um i've had success with that way of doing it and there's a lot of things you can see if you see the decoloration of the leaves and stuff um on the edges and like you can notice that there's a, a nutrient deficiency um i use natural compost that i make myself so i never go in like ah oh, nitrogen it's like <laughs> compost yeah. it and uh, it works i don't need to balance things the most technical thing i've had to do is i have a blueberry bush that wasn't flowering and i added some peat husk or what um what what was it just an acidic um based peat for mm. the ground it needs an acidic soil to produce and to flower so that was like the only thing i had to really go hmm let me research the rest mm. of it all been watching if they wilt or whatever just a bit of water and they come back if they're mm. decolored a bit of fertilizer and they come back so yeah it is a trial and error um mm. in containers you'll have a probably a lot more of that than in the ground so yeah, yeah. If no, i was uh, i was aware that that's uh, that's the challenge of what i'm going to have to deal with but yeah mm. needs must um and yeah it's um what i've also noticed uh, is the fact that you uh, what helped me a lot was the fact that I have a notebook where I pr pretty much write down, okay, this didn't succeed. I'm going to try X. And if it doesn't work, I write down that this didn't work. So I'm going to try mm. something else. And that's mm. how I figured out what was wrong with many of my, with many of my plants through just checking, uh, checking uh, all my, checking uh, my speculation. Yeah. And I have a question here. I see there's a question strange. here for you from Sideline Opinions who asks, Brendan, are you an organic farmer? No pesticides. 
Yes. Well, organic, there, there, there's a very, uh, in the market, organic means something very specific. So like I use a lot of my kitchen cutoffs that will be of plants that aren't organic. So if I had to put that in my soil and let that grow, there's a lot of stuff that's laid off from products that we've bought in the past, you know? So mm -hmm. it wouldn't be technically considered organic, but I don't put anything synthetic in my garden at all. I haven't put a pesticide ever. Uh, I use marigolds, nasturtiums, um, garlic, um, basil. Um, all the, all the, the plants the, of a strong the smell. <laughs> yeah, the defensive plants so with pungent um, aromas and pheromones mm -hmm. or whatever it does to ward off the bugs. And yeah, we've also fortunate to have like a, a lizard colony that just... Mm dominates the bugs in yeah. our garden so no, i leave the yeah when the i've got some spider webs there uh, between my pots and containers yeah. as well and they catch a lot of the the insects which is a good thing and um oh, it's so great yeah, when you, it comes to the excuse me yeah i was just going to say if you set um the the ecosystem or if you just order the ecosystem in in a, a coherent way where things are all in their proper place you really have to you can let it go for a bit. Like there's a bit of preparation and things like that. But mm. I really, really believe that that things mostly take care of themselves. And if yeah. you stop them early enough, they never escalate to a point where you need like this heavy chemical intervention. Um, mm. And that just uh, that heavy intervention uh, leads to other problems. Uh, then you're pretty exactly. much. What's the point of growing your own food uh, if you're just going to also? drown it in chemicals then it's, yeah, it's poison sort of, yourself anyway you just might as well go buy it at the shop <laughs> exactly um, yes and yeah and that's that that actually relates to the the theme of today though the title of today's episode and that's the the benefit of growing your own food and i think there's a it's actually a lot of benefits but i can only speak from my own experience my main benefits that i've gotten is firstly um well maybe i just should get it out of the way there's not a financial benefit uh, you shouldn't be thinking this is going to save you a ton of money um, it is a hobby. You're going to. Uh, it's something that you're going to put a lot of time and a lot, uh, sometimes a lot of money into as well. If you are if you are starting off, it's going to get easier and it's going to get cheaper as you as you progress. But in the beginning, it's going to take a little bit of an investment to buy the tools that you need, um, containers if you're growing in containers, um, uh, etc. But there are a lot of benefits that you get from it that are not uh, monetary. Firstly. Um, when you have a lot of different uh, vegetables growing in your garden, like, for example, um, a lot of spinach or a lot of tomatoes, you're almost forced to incorporate that into your uh, into your dishes now. Yeah. So I'm eating a lot more spinach and tomatoes and uh, yeah. market <laughs> and, and uh, thyme and all these different herbs and uh, the different vegetables and more celery than ever before because I have them in the garden. If I leave them, they just go to waste. So I'm oh. getting a lot more... Uh, diverse uh, uh vegetable intake just by the fact that they are there and i can't let them go to waste now um so that's a major benefit uh, is the fact that you you just you just your your diet just becomes so much more wide in regards to the it's not just it's not just potatoes uh, the chips that you're eating you're, you're you're eating a lot of different vegetables that you're incorporating into your dishes and you're you're almost naturally pressured to start incorporating them um because they're there yeah, no, I love that you've said that. Like that was my experience as well. It's so it's so funny that uh, you 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 care so much about what you've grown and you've seen all the time that it's taken, and you just think like, oh man, I'm not just gonna throw that extra tomato mm. away or whatever it is. But if it's a packet of tomatoes in the fridge and it goes off, it's like, oh well, whatever. But your yeah. own one, you're gonna be like, oh, I love that thing. Why why am yeah. I? I'm not gonna throw that away. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very much yeah, so. so. It's a relationship, so, hey? Your yeah. garden is a relationship between yourself and nature. So um, you appreciate it a lot more, for sure. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's the, that's definitely one of the main benefits. As someone that didn't always eat a lot of vegetables in my diet, uh, not, I didn't have a wide variety. I, did, I didn't not eat vegetables at all. But when I started uh, growing my own vegetables, suddenly I'm eating a lot more vegetables that I wouldn't have bought at the store. Now, for example, mm. Good example is the spinach. Now I've got a lot of spinach because I've I've got it now. I've got it down. I'm uh, yeah. my spinach is very spinach happy. It's, I'm, it's so happy I made it the the thumbnail of the. I, I was boasting it with the thumbnail of this episode. But now I'm eating a lot more spinach because if you buy spinach in the shop, you put it in the in the refrigerator or and it it, it lasts a, a week 
maybe, mm -hmm. and then it's wilted and then it's dead and then it goes brown and it uh, gets mold. Um, mm. But when it's growing in my garden, I can any day of the week, whenever I want, I can go get fresh spinach there in the garden and I don't have to put it in the fridge because I just can go mm. get it fresh from the from the garden. It's taking care of itself. It's just sitting and waiting for me there, getting bigger the more and longer I wait. Um, and it's I'm, I'm incorporating it into it to all my dishes now. And another example is the celery. I mean, I'm not going to always have celery uh, if i was just buying it from the shop i would probably buy it like once or twice a year if i'm making a specific dish with it but now it is there in the in the garden so i'm incorporating <laughs> it almost on a weekly basis and all these different things so <laughs> that's definitely a major benefit uh, health wise i think it all it, it will it helps you definitely uh, diversify your diet for, so you're not just eating uh i don't know just eating potatoes and the, the occasional uh, veggie that you just by chance bought that week mm. yeah my, oh, uh, it's funny my dad used to say celery is a waste of time <laughs> just <laughs> because it has no flavor and no like content in it but yeah it's cool mm. your your spinach um uh evolution must translate into carrots now because carrots mm. are, are super nutritious they're really good for you and you can just keep them everywhere so just go plant a carrot wherever and then if you want a carrot pull it out and it's it's great Mm. Yeah. yeah so that's definitely the, the well that's that's the first benefit down the second benefit mm -hmm. yeah hindo is touching on it now is the learning curve and the humbling experience mm -hmm. working with nature that's i i can't stress this enough it's i think we talked about it last time but it uh, it needs to be emphasized working with the soil working with plants it just it satisfies something primal and ancient in you that the modern world just doesn't give you it it satisfies a, a need that you didn't even know you had. Like it feels nice to do it. And if you feel a sense of triumph when that, those fruits and vegetables start to grow and you know, it's a, uh, uh, it's your uh, sweat of your brow that, that caused it. And you, you created this reality, but at the same time, it, it just feels right. It feels like, this is what I was supposed to be doing all along. It's not just a, a, a niche hobby. It's actually something that in general, my ancestors have been, all been doing for thousands of years. And we just stopped mm -hmm. doing it in modern times. And it just, it just activates a part of your ancestral memory where you just feel like you're doing something that you should have been doing from the beginning since you were born. Yeah. Well, again, just to use the word again, it's a relationship, right? It's like, if you go to the shops and and you just uh, consume your food without knowing how it happens how does food just appear like you can have an abstract idea of oh it's grown on a farm but when you see the process and feel it it's very very different the dirt mm -hmm. under your fingers and uh, the smells of the things and the bugs walking everywhere and uh, I, I don't know it's just there, there's something more to just the the the, the material entering your body to sustain you it's it's mm. understanding the principles of life like in front yeah. of you you're watching how growth actually happens and that things need to be cared for in a specific way and if you don't it just doesn't happen and i think that changes you more than it changes the actual garden and mm. uh we don't have that in in the modern world not not, not with mm. our supermarket culture i think yeah uh, that separates yeah. us from nature yeah. So the food, yeah, you you were you used the term now there that you it doesn't just feed you, but yeah, the food nourishes you, but the the activity nourishes your soul and it nourishes your your psychological well being as well. And I can mm -hmm. can testify that from my side, I've um, experienced that I've experienced that, and I, I feel nice when I've mm -hmm. achieved something uh, in <clears throat> in the in the vegetable garden, or when I've just been working with the soil and I've been working with the plants. Uh, before we continue, I want to just give a shout out here to Man Patria Podcast. I see they are in the chat. Uh, I'm glad that you uh, that you tuned in. Thank you very much. If you guys have any questions, uh, you you're welcome to put them in the chat. We will get to as many as possible. Um, any questions regarding the topic? Uh, Defreiter Watcher says, My grandmother taught me the cooking term, the Holy Trinity, which is onion, carrot, and celery, the base of almost uh, of most savory recipes. That's a good one. Um, I'm growing onion and celery. I haven't done the carrot because I just hear all these horror <laughs> stories of people waiting for their carrots, and then months later, it's just the size of like a, a, a finger. 
like oh, a tiny little pinky finger. <laughs> it needs some some nutrients, surely. Then mm. my experience of carrots have either been like a, a Cthulhu face looking thing where it's like all tentacly and whatever, uh, or like perfect, really big, massive carrots. I think you showed the photos of them the last time. Yes, like, yeah, I did. And they're 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 not hard to grow they're this is the easiest thing to grow ever you put it in the ground you water it if you miss watering it out it's like robust it's like from where's it from it's from like afghanistan or something originally mm. and they you can leave them the whole year they don't have a season at least in our in our south african climate and uh yeah they're so good for you dude like mm -hmm. yeah and they are yeah, nice. somewhere and leave it yeah uh well um <clears throat> uh, before i get to uh what i've been planting this uh this spring uh, another mm. with i just want to cover all the the benefits that's uh, from because that's the theme of the episode um <laughs> growing your own food i think the last thing that's a big big benefit that i think is, is sometimes overlooked i think everyone like i said at the beginning everyone uh can't look me well, not everyone a lot of people can't look past oh it's just going to save me a lot of money like but there's a lot of unseen non-material benefits that are much more important to me and the the last unseen non-material benefit for me is just the fact that and you may you touched on it earlier i have a new newfound richer perspective on where food comes from how difficult it is to grow food it's not just you put a seed in the ground and you forget about it um some plants are like that where they'll they'll manage if you leave it alone but it does often need a, some human intervention if you're growing it in an urban setting where it's not really in nature it's it's in a an unnatural setting like a uh, in a in a in a pot or in a in a container or in a small garden where it's not the, it doesn't have the ecosystem as you mentioned earlier that it would have in in nature that supports it um, but then also that gives you that perspective where you are yeah, growing stuff is difficult. Often there's a lot of difficult stuff that you have to figure out. And there's a lot of waiting and patience. Patience is difficult for a lot of people. You, it teaches you patience. It's not like I actually honestly think there's a lot of people that think you just put a seed in the ground and a week later, the veggie is there it's like it's, it's like some no. of these things and then there's the disappointment but again that's a that's a good perspective to have a, a lesson to learn as well where you've been waiting for this plant to yield for like three months mm -hmm. and then it just doesn't happen then it dies it just gives up and it, or, or it just it just stays in a state where it's not yielding and mm -hmm. you're you're doing you think you're doing everything right so it, it it has that failure aspect to it as well that teaches you a valuable lesson that not not everything just works out not everything is just as simple as putting a seed in the ground and waiting mm. it's kind of like investing like mm. the original investing you can put your money in a cool stock and it can yeah. increase massively or it can just tank and sit there yeah. and yeah. a lot of plants are like that too even genetically you can have all the conditions right and you just get a dud seed that grows a little bit and mm well that's that's life yeah um so this is something that i don't know a lot about but maybe you've done some research on this and that mm. is the the whole process of actually more well, heirloom plants but uh do you when you you probably you said last time on the episode that you harvest some of your own seeds and um, like some some of the plants you'll use the seeds again but do you select them for the strongest and the best ones or do you just take some some random seeds or is there actually some process that you go through in selecting no. the seeds Oh, that's an interesting question i haven't thought of like the strength of things like a almost yeah. eugenics approach but <laughs> no 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 <laughs> um all my yeah so i'd get right now my lettuce is bolting so all of the mm. lettuces it's gotten too hot all the seeds are starting to form i'll just take those seeds um scrape it all off put it in a packet and then when i mm. needed to use it again i'll just drop them in um mm. tomatoes like also we use them, chop the seeds out, just dry them, and we use those. The same with the chilies. The only things I don't use the dud chilies, I guess. Um, you'll get like ones with spots or whatever, but I don't go and think, hmm, mm. this is the best one. Let's use the seeds. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but maybe I should actually. I, I just haven't mm. thought of it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And uh, that's the other thing is uh this this season now uh, like i said earlier is the first time now for multiple seasons that i'm maintaining a vegetable garden and this season as well i've I've not bought any new seeds all the seeds i've planted now are seeds from plants from the previous garden firstly mm -hmm. 
or secondly are, are off cuts that I didn't expect were going to grow. The best example is the cabbages. So one time we just bought a cabbage that we made the dish out of. And then I, I use all the off cuts from the kitchen. I work them back into the garden as, as compost. And then these off these these stubborn little off cuts from the the cabbage the bottom of the cabbage just started growing again. I saw these leaves popping up that from the middle of my garden that I didn't recognize, and then I saw they were like tiny little spin uh, cabbage leaves. So I gave them their own little spot, and now they're growing very nicely. So I'm going to have two heads of cabbage soon, and I didn't pay for them. It's just they're just growing from the off cuts, and a lot of veggies work like that. Mm. Yeah, my my interesting new um, mechanism of getting new veggies in my garden is um, all my family and friends know that uh, I'm this hippie gardener dude. So <laughs> every random once in a while they come past and say, oh, I thought of you. He has a plant. Yeah. So I've got a few plants that are. You just, just adopt all these little plants. You yeah, can't throw them away. <laughs> yeah, my lemon tree is from a friend of mine. Uh, I have four lettuces, uh, not lettuce, spinaches from uh, my mother-in-law and um, mm. uh yeah, there's some other things around there, but yeah, all just gifted. So that's cool. Yeah. Make nice friends. They might give you plants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's the thing is the, with time. And that's what I'm trying to do is your, your, your seed bank starts growing. So you you create your own little database of seeds and mm -hmm. you can just constantly use them. Um, and that's what I want to get to that point where, where you don't have to buy any new seeds. So I did buy, mm -hmm two new types of seeds this year but earlier not now in spring earlier actually last time when i started i didn't have uh, any last time when we chatted and i didn't have any space for them i bought radishes and turnips but this time i had two spare like uh, uh, containers lying around um that i then uh, planted these radishes and turnips in because i had these seeds uh, and they've already started growing out they they look very very keen to start uh, producing so they they look very just happy yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah they just want to be alive and they just want, just want to be <laughs> harvested and uh, feed their master <laughs> they look super yeah, super keen dude <laughs> oh that's great yeah for your seeds are you storing them in the fridge or anything like that if you do collect or uh, if no i'm not just storing in them in a, in a dry dark place dry dark place okay that's mm. cool some seeds also like a bit of cool or or they mm. die like they are um what would you say they, they have the nutrients that, are, that require them mm. to be alive and some of those nutrients do fade in heat mm. i guess if that's okay. the right way to say how it. do you how do so, you store your seeds um in little packets in 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 the fridge hmm. or freezer depending on oh, the, the so you freeze them yeah yeah i learned okay. that from from um uh, my future brother-in-law he he's also quite a green finger <laughs> green finger <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's got green fingers as well and he's you were a, you were trip. a green finger denialist earlier now you <laughs> yeah yeah now i'm using the words oh gosh the propaganda got me yeah <laughs> yeah Okay, no, I didn't know that. I'll, uh, I'll actually maybe, uh, maybe try that. Find a, a small little corner in the fridge and uh, and freeze those seeds. I just have to check. Maybe, maybe some of them aren't. Uh, I can keep outside, and some of them I have to freeze. I wasn't aware of that. So there, you've taught me something as well. I hope uh, mm. uh, someone in the audience have learned as well. At the moment, like I said, I'm just keeping them in a, in a dark, dry place. Dark place yeah. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, the 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 seeds that I have used from last season have all started growing, except the mm. coriander. But I'm still waiting. It, it hasn't been very long since I planted it, so it's probably mm. going to take a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, no, I'll definitely, definitely try that. Um, before we uh, before we continue, there was a I see here so just some people in the chat that I wanted to greet. I see Rick Hearn says Huyanant, Huyanant, Rick. Um, Hindo is also here, but he's been here from the start, and uh, Taito is here, and um, Hindo says gifted garden. Um, and then also sideline opinion says, I, I want to fool the birds this year by harvesting my figs while they're still green to jam them. Um, <laughs> well, I, I do love a, a fig jam. The, the problem is just, uh, uh, as, um, as Brendan said, the, the figs also, they don't just automatically grow. They need it. They need that little fly, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's a but will that fly wasp, naturally yeah. be attracted to the, or that little wasp would naturally be attracted to the, the fig tree? Uh, I believe so. I think there's a lot of pheromones in the air that I, I believe that um, bugs find their way through anything is through the pheromone chemical trails. So mm. it must do. 
And if it doesn't, mm. I don't know how things exist. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, uh, while we're on that topic of lessons learned, I mean, I learned now about the mm. seeds. Um, what have you learned recently? Now, recently doesn't have to be last week or even last month. What are some of the the new lessons that you've learned that you've definitely now uh, that you've incorporated into your your gardening strategy? Oh yeah, I got a pretty recent one. So I pulled out all the grass from my backyard. It was just a lawn. And my process was cut out a box of ground, put in some plants, cut out a box, put in some plants. So I ripped out all of the grass now and it's all potential garden. And uh, the sun started turning the ground into uh, sand, deserty kind of blow away mm. stuff. So what I let happen this year during winter is the ground that I wasn't using, I let the weeds just overgrow and stay. I didn't leave it, pull them out, didn't stop them from seeding, nothing. I let them grow and it held it holds the top layer intact. So when the wind blows, mm. it doesn't blow your sand away. And um, it was doing that because on our brickwork, we'll, we'll have just a bit of dust um, on, the, on the edges that's just no longer there. So yeah, you don't want to lose your top layer of soil. That's not a good thing for any reason. And um, yeah, don't be afraid of weeds if they can aid in uh, your containment. Otherwise, mm. plant over or mulch over everywhere if you need to. But mm. for me personally, it was a cheap strategy to keep my ground intact. And mm. yeah, it worked. That was yeah. a, so the, new... the use of weeds is to to keep the, the ground that you're not using intact. But the when you're planting mm. something there, the big threat uh, from the weeds is that they compete for nutrients. Oh, you pull them out then. So when yeah. I'm about to start an area, I'll pull the weeds out and then I'll compost over the top and then I'll plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Why is that top layer of soil so important? Well, the top layer of soil is where most of like the bug life and all those type of things live, like all your earthworms and stuff. Like when the mm -hmm. ground starts going deeper and deeper, it starts turning into stone and rock and shale and all that other stuff. And there's not a lot of life down there. So all the life needs to be on that top layer where all the roots mm. and um, mycelia and all those other um, mm. weird things of life that we don't particularly understand or uh, I don't Particularly understand. the things that you don't see. Yes, yes, yes. Those, those mysterious processes. And that's all yeah. in the top layer of soil. Um, yeah. And if it blows away, it blows away all the way down to where it gets hard and then you can't plant there. So yeah, you've mm. got to keep your, your, your soil intact. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the experiments that I tried that paid off handsomely was that I, I don't know if I mentioned it last time. I took some earthworms from the from the garden and I put them mm. in the containers where I was growing the veggies. And then just before spring, I just uh, took the all the dirt within the, the, the containers and uh, mixed it up a little just to get the top uh, at the bottom and a little bit of the, the soil that was compacting at the bottom mm -hmm. to loosen it up a little. And I took out earthworms from those containers as almost as thick as my finger um yeah, these yeah. guys were thriving in my pots and they were create they they were turning because at the beginning all these pots i filled them with a lot of like mulch and uh, uh just things from the garden that needed to be broken down and they just broke down all of that and they turned it into pretty much soil they they their, their excrement is just the 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 clay clay like soil so it makes the soil a lot thinner and a lot uh, not thinner but like um finer mm -hmm. but it, it turns uh, it turns all those uh garden scraps into dirt um so they've they've just been thriving and i know they've been they've been thriving because well firstly i saw the big worms when i when i uh plowed the the dirt a little bit mm -hmm. but then also when I put some vegetable offcuts from the kitchen in the ground, they just disappear. Something's coming. Yeah. So it's definitely the, the earthworms coming and munching them. Yeah, and turning them into mm. soil and turning them into compost. So mm. that's the thing is I want my own compost heap and compost system as you do, but I don't have the space. So I'm just using the earthworms as a crutch so they turn all the offcut. They, they are my little mm. compost creators. There's something you can do. I'll send you yeah. photos of this after this chat. Um, yeah. uh, I've got a little worm farm, maybe about, oh, okay, well, this is not going to be good. There's no <laughs> reference, but um, just a little container, pro probably similar size to what you're growing in. Fill that with a, a bit of husk, like um, uh, whatever peat stuff, water it, put your mm. food in, put some earthworms, and then let that thing turn it into soil and just keep adding your mm. food scraps to that. And you can have a little box mm. of, compost machine or worm farm mm, yeah and you should send me that i'll definitely uh definitely give it a try uh before we continue i see a uh, rick has a comment he says 
ek het pampoene vloer geplant verlede jaar, so dat ek kon oes voor die pampoen gog as hulle kon ta- takel, I think that's what he means. So, uh, he's saying he, he planted some some pumpkins before the, the, the time where the bugs come out that eat them. Lee Rendler says, greetings from California. I believe we have a similar climate, and that's often described as Mediterranean, hot, dry summer, cool, wet winter. Enjoying this talk. Thank you very much. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Um, little bit of a difference there. Hot, wet summer in Gauteng in the north of, uh, generally the north of South Africa. So you get summer rain, a lot of rain and thunderstorms uh, and humidity during the, the summer. Winter here is cold and dry. Um, you get frost, so it kills any little plant that tries to grow, especially when they're growing from a seed. If you plant, that's what I would try to avoid this spring as well, is if you plant too early and those seeds start sprouting and the frost comes, they're all just going to be decimated. Um, and then you said, uh, uh, oh, yeah, no, that's the, yeah. So uh, almost that's what you're describing there. Um, is what I grew up with. So I grew up in um, in Marmesbury in the Western Cape. That's in the south of the country. And that's mm. there you have hot, dry summer and cool or cold and, and wet winter. Um, so, yeah, no, I do know I do know that uh, that type of weather um, that I, for 23 years of my life, I did experience uh, winter and summer like that. I had to adjust a little when I moved here to Pretoria, to Gauteng, but I, I do enjoy the, the summer thunderstorms. But thank you, uh, Lee, for the for the nice comment. Um, this uh, this win- oh, this spring, um, are you going to – you've already gone through some of your – go-to vegetables but uh, is there anything else new that you haven't mentioned that you're going to try or that you're considering maybe even uh, recently consider that you might want to try mm, not food wise i just want some more flowers in my garden this this year mm. around so it's pretty much going to be the same kind of thing i've got potatoes um, tomatoes carrot spinach melons pumpkin all that kind of melony uh, squashy stuff um, corn and then yeah i just want the flowers to be around i want things to look more pretty than just orange marigolds mm, mm. so i'd like a, a variety of flowers and some more herbs and tea kind mm. of mixy stuff that you can just experiment a bit that's not always consumed mm. by chewing that you can maybe drink something have a herbal yeah. tea or um yeah, just a, a juice, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, some of those things might be new. Mm. I've got a got a tip here from Sideline Opinions who says I also use tree bark around my fruit trees to keep it moist and weed free. Okay, so you you stack it around the so it covers the ground. That's a that's an interesting approach. Yeah, that works for the weeds as well. It doesn't uh, mm. penetrate through that. That's great. Mm, uh, nice. I've got just little um, chips, not not bark mm. full, but mm. yeah. And then, um, seeing it more, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should get, uh, well, finish the the spring topic. Um, mm. Seeing as a, uh, well, this is the reason why I wanted to do this chat is we're going into uh, into spring now, and I think it's the you said it yourself. It's it's plants grow throughout the year, but spring is the best time to to start off if you're a beginner. Um, mm. And I asked you this question the last time as well, but I want to, uh, if someone hasn't seen that episode. Um, if you had to give like three starting Pokemon, like the three, <laughs> three or four uh, basic, basic plants to start off with, that's the, the best for a beginner. What would you point to? Okay, I'm going to do carrot. it. I'm gonna say it. <laughs> carrot. Carrot. <laughs> do a carrot. You can plant it any time of the year and it's going to grow. Mm. Spinach, you've already mentioned how, how much of a master it's turned you into with the rest of your plants. And it's right. quite an easy entry to do. And then tomatoes. Tomatoes are... Mm. Uh, probably the most um, value for effort plant that you're going to grow. Tomatoes in the shop are still expensive. It it boggles my mind. I don't know why. It grows like a weed and there's thousands of them. Um, And they grow themselves next to themselves as well. So, yeah, tomatoes, if you want a lot of something and um, if you like tomatoes, I guess. Mm. But carrots, do tomatoes, the, do the spinach, tomatoes need spinach. something to to support their their leaves on and to support their their um the branches on? Like for example, a frame, or, or can yes. they grow just on their own? You can grow it as a little bush thing, but then you just need to pay attention to water. So the ground and the, the the ground needs to be um, well drained, or else it will rot the leaves. Um, mm. You can bush it if you want; it's not a problem. 
Um, but it is better to train your plant to grow it up and just cut off the side nodes so it grows in one stem upwards as it shoots off a new node, chop it and let it grow up. Um, you can tie it to a single stick in the ground, just wrap it as it grows up, up that way. Or you get what's called a, a trellis, a tomato trellis, where it's like a frame with a, a cross beam and you can have strings coming down from the top and you can mm -hmm. grow your tomatoes up the strings, just wrapping them around. Yeah, mm. yeah. that's a, a pretty good method to do a lot of tomatoes in a row is to have a trellis. Mm. No, excellent. Mm. Uh, well, that's definitely what I've experienced as well. Tomatoes mm. are growing are growing very well. Uh, spinach is definitely also a good one. Or technically Swiss chard, uh, but in mm. South Africa, we just call it spinach. spinach. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give an update next time when we talk about the, the, the garden again, about uh, the radishes and the, uh, the, the, the turnips. I don't know how, how they're yeah. going to turn out. Uh, celery is also very easy. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also thyme is also pretty easy. Um, and another herb that's also very nice that you, that's very versatile for meat dishes is a uh, rosemary and you just, it's just a, it's just a bush. It, bush, it yeah. really comes to a point where it doesn't need any of your attention anymore. Just, it, just if it's very dry, you can give it some water, but that's it. And mm. maybe just keep it in a nice shape. Um, Tato also, says uh, mint is also pretty easy. Uh, yes, but the thing true. about like mint is when you, excuse me? It's like a weed. It just yeah. carries on everywhere. It's such a yeah. nightmare to manage. I took it out <laughs> yeah, the ground and put it in a pot. Uh, yeah. I've killed my mint in the ground. It was too much. <laughs> Yeah. yeah that's what i've that's what i've seen as well mint is is easy and nice and you, it's a nice thing for desserts but um once it's in there you're not getting it out of your garden um you yeah. have to pretty much commit to it being now a part of a permanent part of the permanent ecosystem yeah. forever yeah. <laughs> also just for the rosemary point that's also great mm. for for bugs and things it's also one of those nice mm. pungent mm. um shrubs yeah mm. bushes plants I think that's mm. something that a lot of people overlook is the companion plant uh, angle mm. where well, my rule of thumb is the pungent plants, the, the plants that mm. if you rub their leaves between your fingers, you get a nice smell. So it's usually all your herbs. Um, that's your or, 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 oregano, um, rosemary, um, coriander, um, all the mustard plants, all those types of spices that have mm. a strong smell. So they keep away the, and, and is your approach as well just to, keep the, just to arrange them kind of between the other plants so they they don't mm. compete but they uh, they have a presence everywhere so they're not just clustered somewhere in one corner of the garden yes yes yeah i do have them spread out with my marigolds i uh, like pretty much every spot of the garden that's open has a marigold <laughs> at the point where at full growth um and then uh, i put basils everywhere so they they also just they grow and they die pretty quickly mm. so they'll grow in your season and die so you can just grow them wherever in between everything and they're mm. they're they're super great they, they, right. they smell nice as well i enjoy the smell of them so mm. yeah are, uh, are are the flowers uh, are flowering plants that just produce flowers a good thing do they do they uh, have a benefit I, I would think they they attract the bees and other insects that are good yeah. so just having flowers there that's not a bad thing close to your uh, vegetables yeah well, for the bugs and um, pollen and all those lovely things, for the birds even, it's great. Even to attract bugs for birds to eat, that birds like, I don't know, pick your ground. It, it does good things. Um, mm -hmm. And they're all kind of intangible. You can't really say like, ah, oh, this month we had great birds because of this good flower. It's kind of like a little no, not wavy exact process. Science. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but then also just not to understate your, your factor. Like you, you want to go outside and look at a beautiful garden, right? Like, mm. why not? We, mm. We're alive and we enjoy beauty. So make your space beautiful. I think mm. that's also an important thing for us human beings. Um, yeah, our modern architecture and modern lifestyles and all this stuff is taking everything us away from. Yeah, it's making everything square and black and white and gray and glass. And uh, let's have some colors and shapes and textures in, in yeah, our natural lives. Like, shapes where it's not symmetrical. It's, uh, exactly, it's great, yeah. but it is, there is a symmetry and a pattern in it. You With just it, have to kind yeah. of look at, look at it from the right angle and you realize yeah. it's actually growing according to a pattern. You've just been a little too, too, um, uh, barbaric to, to realize that there's a lot of <laughs> significance. Human. There's a lot of significance in the way that the plant is growing. The plant's not just growing yeah. randomly. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I've mm. I've, I've seen it with uh, with many of my plants is the fact that um, uh, once you st- one you can see where where it's going, you can see what it needs. So you can see um, if it if it doesn't have enough sun, it'll start leaning towards where the sun is coming from. The the spinach that I grow more in the shade are growing very long stems because it needs more sun. But uh, mm. the, the spinach that gets a lot of uh, a lot of sun makes broad leaves and they're short and stocky. Just nice so and fat, there's yeah. all these little factors, and that's such a nice thing to to learn. So you get to a point where mm. you start realizing, okay, this plant is doing this. That means X. Uh, the plant is doing Y. That means this. Mm. Um, and it's such a nice feeling where you get to a point where you can almost just instinctively know what to do. You don't have to Google what's wrong with my Absolutely. plant. Why is it doing this? How much better is that than a textbook, eh? Like mm-hmm. just that experiential yeah. relationship type knowledge where it's, it's, yeah, like learning to crawl almost. It's one <laughs> step at a time. Yeah. And this was, uh, this was common knowledge for most of our ancestors for the vast majority mm-hmm. of our history. They just knew how to, to work with plants and animals. Um, and maybe it can a, be a gain with more of these mm-hmm. conversations. <laughs> it can be a gain. Mm. We don't don't give up hope now. Teach your kids how to garden. <laughs> mm. All of them mm. make our suburbs. That's the that's another. Uh, Why well, I don't have my own children yet, but that's another aspect to it. Is it's such a good uh, opportunity for the transfer of knowledge from intergenerational, mm. but from the older to the younger generation, if they can watch you tend to the uh, plants. Another good example is when you work with animals. Just teaching mm. your children how to uh, raise animals, how to look after animals. It's an excellent opportunity just for the activity of uh, transferring knowledge from one generation to the other. Just that act in itself, I think, is healthy. Mm, yeah, just those principles of life that are consistent through plants, animals, people, everything. That mm. If you get those small things right on the micro scale, you can get them right on the, on the macro scale. Mm. And, um, hey, what a powerful kid you'll have if they understand <laughs> that things need care and attention. I think right. that. And that sometimes, uh, or not just sometimes, often you'll fail. And often yeah. your, your, your crop won't work out. Often Even, you do everything right and it just doesn't work out. That's a, excuse me? Yeah, sorry, sorry. But what, what a teaching moment that will be. Like, mm. if you do let your kid experience failure that's not, like, detrimental to themselves. Mm. Like, like we're, let's try again. Let's figure out what went wrong. Exactly. Yeah. No. That's and then great. the it's then pretty much it, the lesson is cemented when you try it for a second or a third time and it works. Mm. Or oh, even better, maybe they figure it out themselves. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe they go on the same journey you did, but you just planted the first seed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know exactly. Well, uh, Brendan, I think the last thing that I want to talk about before we wrap up is again to circle back to the the topic of tonight's discussion, mm. and that is that why it's important to grow your own food, and I think just some of the the lessons that we learn what we've talked about now that that intergenerational transfer of knowledge many of this these basic lessons are things that you can apply in other places as well Vir- the virtue of patience the the virtue of not giving up um when you fail um the virtue of being or the 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 skill of being attentive as i said earlier not all of these things that are going to be detrimental to your plants or the things that are going to be keeping your vegetables back are going to be things that are just obvious immediately. You can't just go talk to them and ask what's wrong. You have to go investigate. You kind of have to go put your eye up to the stem. You have to go close up and see what's going on. You have to go look in the soil. Are are there any insects there? Are there no insects? And why are there no insects? Are there earthworms in the soil? Um, is there aphids on the stem of my plant that are draining it? Um, all the, uh, or just looking at looking at your garden, you have to pay attention. Are bees visiting my garden? Are, are other insects visiting? Are birds walking mm. around in there? It's not just something where you can spend five minutes a week, just glance over it and you just take everything in, you know what's going on. You have to be attentive. You have to go sit, in, almost quite literally go sit in the middle of your garden and just pay attention. I think that's mm. such an important lesson to learn. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, well, if you learn from your textbook, you might get all your your uh, nutrients correct and you'll have your irrigation system. Your gardening experience will be sowing once a year and turning on your tap. And that's not at all anything. That's just mm. production. And um, gardening is a little bit different to that. I think, I think that that relationship aspect is so underappreciated and so powerful. And yeah, uh, 
if people care for their own little space that they have, I think they can care about bigger spaces from that space, mm -hmm. like just from that platform, mm -hmm. that foundation. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, before we uh, say goodbye, there's actually a question here. We did touch on this earlier, but I think you didn't, uh, you weren't listening at that time. Maybe I think, uh, this uh, this listener maybe tuned in a little bit later. So there's a question from Tato Morare, who asks, do you guys know of plants that have a symbiotic relationship with vegetables, kind of like growing cannabis near peppermint works as a natural insect repellent? Yes. So before, uh, before I hand the microphone to Brendan, um, my rule of thumb is the insect repelling plants are the plants that are strong smelling or the plants that specifically if you rub their, their leaves between your fingers and you smell, it has a very strong herby smell. So this is your rosemary, your coriander, um, your uh, oregano, all these herb, herby leaves that have a strong smell, uh, thyme as well. The insects also don't like that strong smell. It keeps them away. They you'll you'll never see, for example, aphids walking on a thyme plant or on a, a strong smelling plant. They don't like the strong smell. That smell is there. The smell isn't there to make your food taste nice. The smell is there primarily to be a repellent for insects. So mm -hmm. those plants, as Brendan's correctly said earlier, you pepper them amongst the other plants and they help protect the plants that don't have that repelling smell. Um, mm. Brendan, do you have anything to add other nice combinations mm. between plants, symbiotic combinations? Yeah, so there's the, also the inverse of that, where it's not just repellent and defense and all the stuff. Some things also uh, aid in growth and mm. um, also attract um, your, the, the, the pests to that plant. So rather than repel the plant, it'll choose that plant to sacrifice. So you'll have a nasturtium in your, in your garden and all the aphids will go onto the nasturtium because they just love the pollen or whatever's in there. And you're not going to be eating plants. that plant, so you're just using it as like yeah. a distraction, you know, exactly. as a honey pot. Exactly. There you go. You guys go and enjoy yourselves. We don't have to kill you. Um, if you guys are a hippie like me and you don't really want to kill anything, so there you go. Yeah. Go do that. Um, and then other things like strawberries, they, they um, put new, uh, nitrogen into the soil mm. through their roots. So if you have a nitrogen heavy plant, um, you can plant some strawberries nearby and uh, enrich your soil through their chemical process. Um, I'm sure there's very, very I know beans and uh, bean bean plants also uh, do the, put a lot of nitrogen back into the soil. Mm. Mm. So yeah, it's like then, these uh, plants can be used uh, to aid other plants. Um, I'm not mm. too specific on which ones do what. Um, I'm still learning and still trying to figure out what's best mm. for, for my needs. And uh, yeah, if I find some of those more positive symbiotic plants, I'll, I'll share them perhaps mm. another time. But yeah. yeah, they are, they do exist. Mm. And then also uh, another one, but this is pretty obvious, is the fact that plants that uh, make nice big flowers and colorful flowers also attract bees and other insects that uh, will definitely help keep your plants healthy. Then it, it gets a little bit more complicated with... There are some other plants, and I've not been able to nail this because it gets very difficult, where some plants actually enhance fl the flavor of other vegetables. Oh, they, yeah. they, they have an effect on the plants around them in regards to flavor, the intensity of the flavor. Um, but yeah, I don't know that from memory yet. I do have some mm -hmm. notes on what plants do that, but uh, you're going to have to go read up for yourself. But that, I know, I know um, chamomile intensifies the flavor of some plants. I think they intensify... Mm -hmm. One of the things I remember from memory is chamomile intensifies the flavor of onions. I remember onions. that because I planted the chamomile next to the onions. Um, but that's that's if they it, it doesn't mean that the plant is growing just in the vicinity of the onions. It's their roots are interacting and they are actually like neighbor, yeah. physically uh -huh. neighbors. But there's a lot of relationships like that. But that's next level mm. symbiosis. That's yeah. where get, it gets a little bit more complicated. But like I said, rule of thumb for me, the strong smelling herbs, they uh, they keep the insects away. And then the, the, the plants that make nice big flowers, they attract the good insects. Uh, and then lastly, um, I think also, as, as you mentioned, um, the mm. plants that put in the, you just have to go check, just uh, Google um, which plants uh, add nitrogen back into the soil. And as Brendan mentioned, those are like strawberries. And I know that the go-to plant for adding nitrogen into soil is beans, any type of bean or a, um, a viney uh, plant, like a, a sweet pea uh, does mm. the same. It, it creates, it put in, and, and 
another it's not it doesn't always apply but uh, the most most plants like nitrogen in their soil yeah and thank goodness we get a lot of that through rain <laughs> mm. you know, we get a lot of nitrogen rain i don't know if that's consistent throughout the world but at least here in africa that's that's true yeah no i think it's uh, i think it's something that's consistent but I'm, I'm talking under correction i know when when it when it's a thunderstorm there's a lot of nitrogen in the mm -hmm. in the rain but yeah, uh, Taito, um, I'm glad we could uh, give you that so that insight as well. Um, mm. So yeah, we've reached the end of the, the episode now, um, Brendan. I'm just going to give you the last question that, that I always ask my guests, and that is if you could mm. leave the audience with a thought or an idea or a sentiment or any type of thing that you want to keep, want to leave at the, the back of their mind this week um, for maybe like five or four days, they just remember that thing that you said and then they think about it again. Mm. What would you leave them with? What, with? what seed would you plant as a last parting thought? I'm going to use that relationship word again, but let's mm. extend it just a bit further. So rather than view your life as a bunch of, cut up functions, just view it as a relationship between everything. So rather than I need to plant food, like make a garden a thing that you just live day to day so that it's not this section separated thing. And that doesn't have to be for your garden. That can be for your job or for your whatever. Just mm -hmm. instead of your perspective being a perspective that separates things into their own little boxes, um, have it as something that you relate to that you connect with and that i think changes the way you approach things um, and i've learned that through my garden where function is cool and it works and it gets things done but it feels dead it feels i don't know it just feels automated and mm. i don't want to live like that and i don't mm. want my neighbors to live like that and if we can have this relation to the stuff we do, maybe the relation between each other can change. Um, yeah. So think of the relationships between all the stuff and all the people in your life. Hmm. I think that's uh, that's exactly the, the thought I would have wanted to add on uh, to to end on as well is the surround yourself with the stuff that resonates with you metaphorically surround yourself with the plants that you live in symbiosis with uh, so those plants yeah. can be all the type of little activities like gardening going for a hike uh, in-person relationships with people in-person conversations they function the same way as those plants that uh, that work together in symbiosis. Some of them increase the flavor of your life. Some of them keep pests away, uh, etc. Yeah. So um, that's uh, that's what I, I also want to end on is the fact that uh, surround yourself with the things that resonate. Surround yourself with the things that are real, the things that are real experiences. Don't just don't just fall into escapism um, and uh, don't just fall into rigid. Everything needs to be by the books. Everything needs to be just a, a biological machine. Um, live in a nice balance and in a, in a, in a rhythm with what's going on around you. And, and that's something that a garden will teach you working with animals as well. Working with animals also gives you that where you, where you are. And I think it's good that you use the term relationship because there's a relation between you and that plant and between you and that garden, between you and those animals that you work with. And that relation gives you that perspective of I'm now in a, me and this object or me and this activity are now in an orbit and we are just like the moon pulls the ocean uh you are also pushing the the other the other object with your gravity and it's pulling you the the metaphor is getting a bit abstract now but i think you get the get the idea that's how you need to be looking at what's around you and like i said earlier just a um a final uh, uh emphasis again surround yourself with the things that are wholesome surround yourself with the things don't don't knock what uh, I mean. I'm preaching to the choir with this, but don't knock what your your ancestors surrounded themselves with. Uh, learn from their experience. Mm -hmm. They surrounded themselves with things that uh, gave them meaning. Just try it out. Maybe it'll it'll give you what uh, what you you've been looking for for so long as well. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in. I hope you learned something. I even learned quite a bit. Um, but I didn't. I mean, I didn't go into this conversation not expecting to learn anything. Um, uh, Brendan always uh, has a lot of insights. But I mean, your insights come from your passion for your hobby as well. I mean, you can. I can see that. Uh, 
you enjoy what you're doing and it's it's not just something like you said that you're ticking off a box you're just saying i need a vegetable garden because this will increase my profits and my uh, uh money yield by 4.57 percent it's like you shouldn't be looking at it in that material way um you should be looking at it in a more spiritual more transcendent way um and yeah but thank you very much brendan and thank you very much everyone that tuned in as well thank you for your comments and your questions well thank you everyone <laughs> i'm not sure if i can end this but um yeah there is no end button for me but thank you everyone thank you for listening to me i i hope that you enjoyed and learned stuff. And Aaron, uh, when you see this, perhaps maybe thank you as well for having me on. Um... All right. So I just wanted to let you guys know that uh, the the power went off. <laughs> so I don't know if you're if anyone's still here. Um, I'm just using my backup power now. It's a uh, load shedding. So it's a uh, and yeah, that's why uh, there's probably a. Uh, there was probably a, just a, a, a moment where I just disappeared. <laughs> All right. Uh, cheers, guys. Have a good one. And uh, God bless.